everybody. Hi, and welcome to Kappa Live. I am Jill Ryder, and today we have a really wonderful guest with us. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about her. Her name is Laura Spies, and she is one of our Kappa faculty. She recently moved to the Myrtle Beach, South Carolina area from Charlotte, North Carolina. Uh, I'm so glad that she's still there taking care of all of our um, anyone who wants to do a training for the labor doula program and the childbirth educator program in the Carolinas. Um, and all right, I'm going to tell you a little bit more about Laura Spies because she's pretty awesome. Um, she is the Essentials Program Director at Vintage Remedies, a school of natural health. And between that and her passion with childbirth education, she's been taking care of families for over a decade. So I'm really excited to have her here with us today. She's going to be kind of continuing the conversation about how to find evidence-based information. This is something that a lot of our members ask questions about. A lot of our whether you're a labor doula or a childbirth educator, a postpartum doula, a lactation educator, or a new parent educator, understanding evidence-based information is really important. At CAPA, and CAPA is the Childbirth and Postpartum Professional Association, one of our four cornerstones is using evidence-based information in practice. So I'm really excited to have Laura join us and share some, some more tips about how to use evidence-based information when we're working with families. All right, let me bring her on. Welcome, Laura. Hi, Jill. Hi, thank you so much for being here with us. I'm very excited to be here. Yay. So um, after today's show, I will be posting a link to your original Kappa blog post down in the comments. So um, wherever you are watching this, you can click below if you want to get all of that information. Um, and so, Laura, I think one of the questions that I get asked the most is, like, why can't I just look up studies on my own and interpret them on my own? Yeah, and that's, it can actually be kind of a complex answer because in some cases you can, you totally can. Um, if you come across a study and it's it's something that's familiar, it's something that's had a lot of study around it and there is pretty much agreement um, in the results and it's very clear cut, um, those are great ones to pull up, read through and uh, methods, read through the researcher's conclusion um, and it fits in with the knowledge that we already have and that's easy, done, right? right. Um, but oftentimes where people like me, people like us, who are not trained researchers get in trouble, is when we find a study on something that's new. It's totally new information. Um, we're just starting to, to learn some more things about this area of birth or this area of health. Um, and then we try to do some interpretation of what went on in the study. And the tricky part with that is that research studies and then the articles written immediately about those studies by other researchers is that they're written for researchers. They're written for scientists. And so there's a lot of assumptions that are made. Um, the language that they use is different than how we would use it in regular everyday life. So they're assuming that you know those terms, that you know the research methods, and that you know why they picked those. Mm -hmm. um, and then also that you have some knowledge of statistics. And so you understand how they used the data, how they got the results that they did. Um, and if we don't, it's really easy to read what they wrote and take it the wrong way. Um, and there's actually, I was just reading a great blog post, and I can post this um, in this thread too, um, by a university that does a ton of research on essential oils. And she just put up a post on terms that are commonly misunderstood, and it's fascinating. Mm -hmm. uh, like the one I see the most, and you may see this too when you talk in trainings about manipulating data. Mm -hmm. Always my students think, oh, manipulating, like that's deception. Right. <laughs> but it's not, that's not what it means. If we say manipulating in regular life, it means something totally different mm -hmm. than in a study. So you just have to be careful which ones you're trying to interpret on your own and which ones you need to look somewhere else for somebody else to, to do that translation for you. That's really helpful. And I think, you know, anybody can take a Kappa training. Anybody. Oh, yeah. As long as you're over 18. <laughs> so <laughs> you don't need to have any prior knowledge. Like you said, you don't have to be a researcher. Um, that's a question that I get asked a lot. I don't know about you, but when people are like, I really want to be a labor doula or I want to be a postpartum doula, the question that I get asked is, you know, what do I need to know ahead of time? And you don't. You, anybody can take a training. So I think it's really helpful to know that, you know, it's okay that we're not researchers. 
These are things that you can learn. And if you're not sure, that's one of the things I really love about our CAVA community where you can come to your trainer, you can reach out in our membership group and you can kind of ask more questions if you're not sure. Um, and there are resources available to help those of us who don't have that training still find the evidence-based information that we need for our practice. Exactly. And I know that's part of training and certification as well. Yeah. So uh, I just, I want to tell everybody who might be listening or watching that like, it's okay. Um, you know, a lot of, we all come to this profession kind of from different places. And so it's always really interesting what skills we bring to the table just on our own. And so, yeah. yeah I knew nothing. I, I had a baby. <laughs> I know. So can we have like a real moment for a minute and just say like, I know when I first started, one of the funniest things for me, I was at a, um, a, a meeting and I mean, this was probably 10, more than 10 years ago. And before I was a postpartum doula, anything, and people were talking about VBACs and I was like, okay, so I'm a postpartum doula. You know, I'm just, I hadn't started my training yet. And they were talking about VBACs and birth. And I'm just like, what in the world? So I went home and I like Googled it. And I, that's always something that I share, you know, or often I share in my trainings that we all are beginners when we start a training. And it's okay not to know things. Do you have anything you want to share where you were like, oh, this is what they're talking about? There's I know. So many. <laughs> There's so many. I wouldn't even know where to start. Yeah, there were so many things. I mean, it goes all the way back to when my I had a doula for my first birth, and I had to ask her how to change a diaper as a grown woman who had babysat, who'd done all those things. Mm -hmm. I didn't know any of that. And even just a few years ago, I was talking to a postpartum doula who was teaching me stuff about that side of it that I'd never heard of. I'm like, I, I do birth. That's it. Everything after that, even though I've had a bunch of kids, I don't know anything right. about that. Right. So we still have our little our areas. <laughs> yes. Well, and that's why I'm so grateful for you to joining for you to join me here today because I think, you know, any way that we can kind of reach people and say like it's okay if you don't know, you can always learn. Um and I think when working with clients, one of the big things is, is just to be honest about what you don't know. Um and say like, you know, I don't really know the answer, but I can find out more. So, and they um, respect that. They don't Yeah. Yeah, we don't you're willing, you're willing to go after that information and find it for them. Exactly. Um, I know that that was something when I was a brand new doula that I was hesitant to say sometimes, but um, often I would get feedback from clients that that was something they really appreciated that I could help them find resources. So anyway, yeah. <laughs> um, I just want to tell all those doulas and educators who might be watching like, it's okay. It's totally okay. You don't know <laughs> the answers. Um, you can't, you can't know. Nobody does. And <laughs> I always find the more I learn, the more I'm like, huh, now I'm going to have to reevaluate other things. Oh, yeah. Uh, so, okay. So one of the things that I really, like, I laughed out loud at first, and I know you weren't trying to be funny, but when I was reading through your blog post, um, when you started talking about the crap test. Oh, no, I was trying to be funny. <laughs> yeah, I like, it totally worked for me. I, I totally laughed. Um, which is always fun when I'm reading something about research. If I can yeah. laugh a little, then I'm like, yeah. Okay. So tell me more about the CRAAP test. And it's C-R-A-A-P. Two A's, yeah. And this is actually a verified method. So if you Google it, there's other resources out there, too, that will give you more examples if you need more than what I gave. Um, I did sort of adapt it a little bit to make it super user-friendly. Um, but this is, you know, if you're if, if you're looking for information on something and you either can't find a study or you need some help interpreting the study, we're talking about tertiary sources or popular press. So a tertiary source is like somebody who's already done that translation for you, like something off the CDC website, something off the World Health Organization website, um, or mainly a popular press where you're trying to say, is this even, does this have any value? Is it worth anything or, you know? Is it crap? <laughs> yeah. um, and so you can go through this checklist. The C is currency. So how much is this worth for me? Um, how old is it? Is there something newer I should be looking at? Is it outdated information? Um, and in our business, we're mainly looking at three to five years old, unless it's like a landmark study, the first of its kind, and then it might be something older. Um, and then the R is relevance. Does this apply to my specific profession, to my clients? Otherwise, I'm not going to waste my time on it. Mm -hmm. um, it also could include skimming through it real quick just to see if any red flags jump out. Um, are they basing their whole argument on one testimonial? Mm -hmm. But you're going to need to find some more resources. 
Um, just because it worked for that one person doesn't mean it's going to work for all your clients, right? right. Um, or are they arguing, you know, does their title say, this is my argument, but then they spend the whole article talking about something else. That's a red mm -hmm. flag for me. Right. <laughs> so if I'm interested in that title, I need to go find somewhere else where they're actually talking about that. Um, and then the A, the first A is authority, and that's the author. Are they qualified to speak on the subject, or are they quoting someone who's qualified to speak on the subject? Um, and you'll see this a lot in mommy blogs, um, and even in some of the, the specific blogs that have, they're trying to push one agenda, um, where they will have somebody interpreting a study who has no training to do that, and oftentimes they're drawing wrong conclusions. Um, and then the second A is accuracy, and that's where you need something to give validity to this. So if I'm looking at a blog post, um, I want to make sure that they are linking to a study or to an editorial or to a researcher to say, like, this is where I got the information. I'm not just making this up. Right. Um, and then the purpose is the P. So why are they writing it? You know, if they're advertising some new prenatal vitamin and then you look in the sidebar and they're also selling that prenatal vitamin, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's biased, but you might want to make sure you have another source to back it up. Right. And that goes more in detail in the article. You can read, you know, they can read through that. Yeah, I thought that that was really helpful. And I hope that anyone who's watching will take some time to kind of think through. You know, it's different. Like you said, if you're reading blogs, mommy blogs, I love reading mommy blogs too. Yeah. I'm a mom. And, you know, when I can read something that resonates with me, like that is powerful. And I've done things that way. Um, you know, but as professionals working with families, we want to kind of take it one step further than just that mom to mom advice and um, or parent to parent or just, you know, um, now we're speaking as a doula or an educator. So I think that we really have uh, we have a responsibility to whoever we're teaching and working with that we do go a step further and make sure that what we're saying is evidence based. Right. And then we can back it up. Exactly. So when you're in training, can you tell me a little bit about how you talk to some of the trainees that you work with about using evidence-based information? I know that you kind of went into that. That's kind of the whole point of everything. Oh. <laughs> um, so can you just give me a little bit more on like, okay, this is what, why we're using it. This is what we're doing, kind of where it's all coming from. Right. Um, yeah. I, we talk about the fact that, that we say we're evidence-based professionals. Mm -hmm. um, the reason we want to do that is because if we can back up the information that we're teaching our clients and our students with evidence, we're making sure that the information that we're giving them is most likely to be effective for them. Mm -hmm. So we don't want to give them a ton of information that might work, it might not work, and then they're going to waste time on that, they're going to waste money on that, they may not get the results that they're looking for. Um, so if we can back up what we're saying with evidence, um, one of the examples that I give in my training is talking about, and this gets a little bit, it, I think it's my childbirth ed training because we're getting into newborn care, um, talking about gas with babies when babies have gas. Mm -hmm. So many babies struggle with that, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, and so it would be the difference between saying, well, if your baby has gas, you can do the mild con drops, you can do the grape water, you can hold a baby in the tummy, you can do, here's 15 different things, try them all and throw them against the wall and see what sticks. Right. Um, and I think that's a pretty common method of doing it. Mm -hmm. But if we can say, here are the studies that have been done, and we've seen that in exclusively breastfed babies, probiotics have a better chance of improving crying time, shortening crying time with colicky babies than myelochondrops do. Now we have some actual information that's backed up by research that they have a more likely chance of getting some help for their baby the first time. Right. Instead of buying everything on the shelf and trying them all one at a time. Right. And asking. And then they can take that resource and that information and reach out to their care providers and have exactly. that kind of evidence-based discussion about, like, I found this. What do you think? Um, which is really important. Yeah. I love it. Yeah. And that gets more respect from your care providers, too, than I heard on Facebook. Yeah. And even if the information is exactly the same. Yeah, being able to say, isn't there this study that talks about this? Mm -hmm. That's going to get a better reaction usually from your care provider and a better conversation with them. I agree. And I've had that experience myself as a parent, um, being able to say like, oh, this is what I found. Not just like, I Googled it. And <laughs> um, so, yeah, I love that example. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. um, okay. So next, when I find information that's different from what I'm teaching, 
at what point do I change what I'm teaching? Yeah. And, and this is a on behalf of all of our doulas and educators who might be right. Like, it's a key question. Um, and we've all been tempted to do it at some point. Say, I've been teaching this way for five years, and now I just read about this new study, and I have to change the way I'm teaching. Yep. Um, and the fact is, we have to follow the body of evidence. So what most of the evidence is pointing toward is where we teach and how we practice. Now, if a new study comes out kind of right field, that's the baseball term, right? I don't do sports. <laughs> Out of nowhere, just out of nowhere. Out of left field. <laughs> um, so if we have this new study that just comes out of nowhere and it says the opposite of what we've been teaching, we need to have patience. We need to wait. We need more research to be done that backs it up. Um, and that's what every scientist and researcher would tell you. They would tell you, you know, if we have this study and we get these results, it needs to be duplicated again and again. We need to make sure that we get consistent results this way before we start changing what we teach. And I think that's really important because we get excited and we want to jump on it. Right. Um, but you need to stay the course, have patience and wait until we're sure that this is where the evidence is pointing. Yes. I love that suggestion. And I, whoever is watching, if you want to look for reliable sources, that was something that you added to your blog post, which I think is really helpful. Um, one of the questions that we get a lot at Kappa from our members is they are recertifying and making sure to stay Current, which I that's something that I just feel I mean clearly I feel it's very important to stay up to date with what our knowledge um, and kind of go back and question do I really know what I think I know can I prove that I know this uh, where is the evidence um, but I really appreciate that you shared reliable sources and some suggestions of where you could get started so anybody who's watching this like okay I have recertification coming up where can I start looking for things um, so again, I know this is something that we didn't like talk about ahead of time, but do you have any suggestions when people are at that point and they're like, okay, I have to read some studies, um, you know, pretend I'm one of the doulas that you trained and I got certified and now I'm coming to you and I'm like, Laura, help, <laughs> I'm trying to recertify and I'm not really sure where to start. I need to read some research studies. What should I do? Um, I always recommend people go to those tertiary sources. And again, that's in the article. So I'm just throwing it out there like everybody knows. What everybody knows what a tertiary <laughs> source is. <laughs> um, I would go to those. Those are either government organizations or universities or um, places that their sole purpose is to take research and translate it into lay terminology. So mm -hmm. they have no bias. They have no skin in the game. Um, they're just putting information out to the public. Um, so I would start there. Mm -hmm. Health organization. American Academy of Pediatrics is a great one for us. ACOG is a great one for us. The Mayo Clinic, a lot of times, will have articles related to our field. Um, and start reading what they've been publishing lately. And then they should have links to the research studies or to the journal articles so you can have that primary source to back it up. Right. I actually, I love, and that's something that we try to do with the Kappa blog, too, is have um, links to sources whenever we write uh, blog posts. And I think it is really helpful to go back and look so that you can kind of read through the whole, like, where did this come from? And right. I want to learn more about it. So I love that advice for our uh, certified members, anybody who is working on recertification. Yeah. Um, so it's so crazy to me. Every time I talk to one of our faculty members, whether it's in person or live, like nobody's here watching us, Laura. <laughs> uh, no, I'm joking. We do have a couple people that are here. Kim is here. Jessica's here um, live with us. So thank you so much for watching and anybody who's on the replay. Um, but I'm always just, it's so amazing having all of our faculty members who are out there serving families and helping our members really understand and take care of families. So I just, I want to thank you for um, kind of wading through this all, you know, helping to explain uh, for people who might not feel as comfortable and confident. Um, I know I, I, I love learning new things, even if I'm like, Ooh, okay. I know what a tertiary source is, but now I'm hearing it in a new way. Yeah. So I just want to thank you for your time and for being my here. Pleasure. Yeah. Um, so if anybody wants to take a training with you, can you kind of, as we close, tell them a little bit more about you, if you have any upcoming trainings, where they can look for you, um, yeah. your own website if you want, just like how they can get in touch with you if they're like, Laura Spies, I have to know more about her. And <laughs> I'm sure that's what they're all thinking. Yeah. <laughs> that's well, yes. My, yeah. my website is 
naturalabundance.me, M-E. Okay. Um, and I had, there's a contact me page on there. If anybody wants to send me an email, you can contact me through the website. And I have, my next trainings are coming up in Charlotte, one in November and one in December. And you can find all that information there. Yay! You can also look on our Kappa website too. Kappa is C-A-P-P-A dot net. You can click on the training tab and that will help you find all of our upcoming trainings. Um, but when you register for a training, you actually register through one of our faculty members. So you would end up going to Laura's page to register. <laughs> so you end up one way or another. <laughs> exactly. Well, again, I want to thank you for being here with me. And this is super fun. And it, I don't know, did it go by fast for you? Hopefully whoever right, watching. Yeah. It was crazy. I was like, boom, 20 minutes, you know, we did it. So it. thank you so much for watching. And I hope everybody has a great day. And you learned a little bit more about using evidence-based information with your clients and in your classes. So thanks again, Laura. My pleasure. Bye, everybody. Bye, guys.